Hello, I'm Dr. Annalene Weston, one of the dental legal advisors at Dental Protection based in the Brisbane office. And I'd like to welcome you to the next installment of Risk Bites, a series of podcasts produced exclusively for members of Dental Protection. Risk Bites looks at the key dental legal risks and issues affecting dental practitioners across Australia and provides helpful advice and guidance on how to steer clear of them, leaving you free to provide safe and high quality dental care for your patients. In this edition, Specialist Referrals and Reports, A Dental Legal Perspective, we're going to focus on exactly as it says, and I'm going to invite my colleague, Dr. Mike Rutherford, to discuss these for you. Thanks very much, Annalene. And today or tonight, if you happen to be listening to this podcast at night, we're going to be talking about specialist referrals and reports from a dental legal perspective. So what exactly do you mean by the dental legal perspective, Mike, and how's that different from any normal referral? Well, it might be helpful to, in the first instance, give an example of when dental protection would recommend usage of a specialist referral. The example that I'm going to give might seem quite trivial, but is one that most practitioners encounter sooner or later, and it can create a lot of angst for both the practitioner and for the patient. So the scene I'm going to set is a dentist is replacing the defective crown on a 3.6. They've removed the crown, prepped the tooth, and they're going to replace it with a ceramic crown. Now at the insert appointment, the dentist has checked the fit which is good, the interproximal contacts are tight, the occlusion is correct, and the patient is asked to check the shade and try biting on it, and everyone is happy with the outcome. The crown is cemented. However, the patient returns after about four days and says that they feel that the crown is bulky and interferes with their tongue, and they believe that they are having trouble speaking clearly. The dentist looks at it and can see no area of bulkiness. They try to reduce and flatten the lingual a little, but are concerned about the integrity of the crown, that it might be compromised. There there ends up being this series of consults where the dentist is sure they can't find anything wrong with the crown they have inserted, and the patient is sure that the crown just isn't right. It's so obvious they can feel it. Now, we've all been there, and if you haven't, you will be one day, I promise you. Now, unfortunately, this creates a lot of anxiety for both people involved. The patient generally starts losing confidence in the dentist's ability because they are sure that they can feel the difference. And then on the other hand, the dentist is sure that it looks like the crown that was there in the first place and looks in keeping with the rest of the dentition. This is an instance where if the dentist in question rang dental protection, we would likely recommend a referral to a specialist prosthodontist for an opinion. And the reason is that the patient is then provided with an independent expert opinion and they are not then reliant on the opinion of the practitioner who provided the service in the first place. Now, if the specialist prosthodontist finds fault in the crown, that it is too bulky or the shape isn't correct, we're obliged to live with that and make alterations as the prosthodontist recommends. However, if the prosthodontist finds that the crown is fit for purpose, we then have an independent expert who can tell the patient that the treatment that has been provided is adequate. And regardless of the feeling that the patient is experiencing, there's nothing appropriate that can be done to alter this. So in this instance, if the patient were to complain to APRA, or unlikely as it might be, if they were to launch a legal claim, we do have as part of the clinical records a record that an independent specialist has verified that the crown was adequate for the purpose. This is in keeping with the dentist's duty of care to engage with the patient's concerns, but it also provides APRA with an independent viewpoint to help them in their decision on whether there are any deficiencies in the treatment that has been provided. This is an example of the use of a specialist referral from a dental legal perspective. When should I refer a patient then? Now, it is not our role to tell dental practitioners generally when they should refer patients to specialists. This can be dependent on the individual scope of practice of the dental practitioner involved. So for some, placing multiple implants would form part of their scope of practice, whereas for others, a single implant would require a specialist referral. It's also dependent on the specific treatment being suggested for a specific patient. There are, however, two instances where it is a requirement to at least offer a specialist referral. The first is that a specialist referral should be offered 
as part of the informed consent process when discussing treatment options of a more complex nature, for example, for third molar surgery or for complex prosthodontic treatment. The second is when treatment is not progressing according to plan. We hear mostly of complaints and claims with this difficulty, with treatment outcomes associated with general dentist orthodontics and less often with complex prosthodontic treatment. Often practitioners delay in making appropriate referral in the face of treatment difficulties, believing they can sort the problem out themselves. Embarrassment can also cloud our judgment on when this referral should be made. Embarrassment in having to tell our patient that we have encountered problems. And sometimes embarrassment that a specialist may comment unfavourably about what they see. I can assure you that we rarely hear of dental specialists making disparaging remarks about a referring dentist's treatment. They are, however, obliged to tell the patient objectively of their findings and suggested remediation if indicated. The delay in referring can land us in trouble at a later date. If a patient does complain to a regulator, this is one of the first questions that is asked. Why didn't you refer your patient when you realised things were going wrong? And the subtext, of course, to this question is also, did you know things were going wrong? What should I include then in this referral? The first thing I would suggest is that even if you do arrange an appointment or an introduction to a specialist via the telephone, that you actually provide a written referral and also that generally you don't use those quick, easy referral pads that some specialists provide. It's not so much of a problem if it is a simple referral for, say, orthodontics. However, there is a requirement of the dental board that a referral should include details of the patient, relevant medical history, relevant dental history, a provisional diagnosis and also the reason that you are referring. Whether it is a referral for management of orthodontic needs, referral for diagnosis or referral for diagnosis and treatment and management. So it is important that these things are spelt out and a paper trail is made available should there be any later difficulties. The referral to a specialist forms part of the dental records. So if a patient ever requests their dental records or if they are subpoenaed by a lawyer or requested by APRA, it is a requirement to produce the clinical referral. It is, of course, more important to provide all the relevant details when something goes wrong. On occasions, we see referral letters to endodontists which simply state, 2-6 has file fractured in mesiobuccal canal. There are no guidelines for the endodontist about how it got there and what stage of treatment that it occurred. Or more importantly, what the patient is expecting and what you're expecting the endodontist to do. And all of these are relevant to our duty of care. Occasionally, patients aren't even informed of what has occurred and is left with the specialist to explain. There is no surer way to lose a patient's confidence than for them to find out via a third party that an adverse outcome has been encountered. It is also important that you are objective in your description of what the presenting condition is and that you do not attempt to coerce the specialist into giving a particular answer. A rather extrapolated example of this would be the bulky 3-6 that we talked about. It wouldn't be appropriate if the dentist refers the patient to a prosthodontist with a commentary along the lines of, please can you convince Mr X that this crown is perfectly okay? Or something along those lines. It is far more appropriate to say that the crown was inserted after checking the patient was comfortable with it, that the patient now reports that it is bulky and impinging on their tongue, and they feel that they are having difficulty speaking. Could you please provide an assessment of the 3-6 crown? Thanks, Mike. So what should I expect from the specialist? In reply, a specialist who receives a referral from you should provide a comprehensive written report and should include a summary of why you referred the patient, the specialist's findings and diagnosis, treatment options presented and recommendations made, and then a summary of the intended treatment as decided between the specialist and the patient, and will generally include a summary of the prognosis and risks and warnings. Most specialists are well aware that there is the potential for any report that they send back to a general dental practitioner will be read by a third party, whether it is the dental board or in rare circumstances by a plaintiff lawyer or somebody acting for the plaintiff lawyers. 
This is particularly relevant in cases where a patient is referred for an adverse outcome, such as a fractured endodontic instrument in a tooth, or say a root displaced into the maxillary sinus or an unsuccessful extraction. Situations like this are obviously far more likely to lead to a patient being disgruntled and perhaps taking further action. Specialists are generally very helpful in these situations and quite careful in the wording they use in replying and ensuring that the patient is treated objectively and in their best interests. So again, even if you are very familiar with the specialist, there's reason to have a little formality and professionalism in the report that you receive back from the specialist and also in the referral that you make to the specialist. In the event of any sort of regulatory action, as a complaint or any legal action, referrals to and reports from can become very important elements of the clinical records and they can at the very least demonstrate that you have provided your duty of care in making appropriate referral after an adverse outcome. But they also offer the independent expert opinion and management that can assist with your patient's understanding of the treatment you have provided or if something has gone wrong demonstrating that you have provided appropriate care for your patient in seeking specialist care. Thanks ever so much, Mike. That was incredibly informative. And thank you to all our members for listening. We do hope this podcast has been helpful to you. We look forward to speaking with you again in the future. Goodbye.